So yes, yes, another book crush. I can't help it. <laughs> Welcome to Sad and Fury Book Reviews. As usual, I am Tina. Today I'm doing a single book review of The Maleficent Seven by Cameron Johnston. So I received this book as an e-arc from NetGalley in exchange for a fair review. So thank you, Angry Robot. You have the best stuff and I very much appreciated it. <laughs> so this book is coming out in a couple weeks and it's a dark fantasy. So while it's not for the faint of heart, this book is extraordinarily entertaining. It's been a long time since I was dismayed when I finished a novel because I was so enthralled by it. <laughs> so if you've seen the movie The Medium Since Seven, or its inspiration, Seven Samurai, this book takes the basic premise, hence the name. So Johnson recreates, you know, the last stand situation from the movies, but in a fantasy setting where the seven village defenders are in fact villains. Uh, so these are not just morally gray people, you know, these are straight up murderers and psychopaths and, you know, demonic beings, basically. So there's Black Heron, who's a demonologist, basically kind of like a witch. There's Maven, a necromancer, Captain Verena, who's a pirate lord, uh, Laura Murfell, a vampire, um, Tiernak, I think I'm saying that properly, <laughs> a disgraced war god, a mog, an orc warrior, and Jarek Hyden, an alchemist, aka a mad scientist. Every single one of these people are, you know, psychopathic or sociopathic, and they treat others as expendable to further their own goals. They are not nice people at all. Yet Johnson uh, intricately balances their terribleness with understandable motivations. You know, we get them. We find them fascinating. Their actions make sense. They are given a few lingering humanistic traits that keep us from hating any of them, really. In fact, some of the most interesting parts of the novel deal with these aspects of their personality. We also get a few side characters, you know, that help even out the madness. <laughs> The main villain isn't very deep, unfortunately, but he serves his purpose well, and I think it's intended that we don't sympathize with him in any way. We don't really need a complex villain in this story, or at least I didn't. What's also awesome about this novel is that how old everyone is. <laughs> sure, some of them were like immortal or at least, you know, semi-immortal, but half the group are in their 60s and 70s. Black Heron is a grandmother. <laughs> this aspect alone is worth picking up the book because it's, it's actually quite funny. <laughs> the gender parody and jokes about traditional gender roles were excellent too. I really appreciated that aspect and I, I thought that was a nice little kind of added touch. The world building is a little light, uh, but the focus of the novel is not on world conflict, but the defense of one small town. So while I wasn't really sure how big the rest of the world is or whether there are other necromancers, for example, it honestly didn't really matter to me. I, I thought it, the basic premise was like, they're defending this town from this attacking force. We don't really need to know about the politics or the, uh, the rest of the world at large. Like most of it was folk, it's, it's a microcosm kind of situation. I loved how Johnson utilized, you know, parts of traditional myths surrounding the various villain archetypes and how he twisted or expanded on them for the novel. For example, Lorimer Fell, the vampire, has both traditional vampiric tendencies and also kind of shapeshifter regenerative abilities that I found really fascinating. I thought that was really cool how he didn't just take, you know, the basic idea of a vampire and just use that. He, he built on that and I found that really interesting because you were learning about this new kind of monster at the same time as having a basic understanding of what it, it's based on. I will say again, this novel is not for the faint of heart. There are numerous kind of trigger warnings in it, I'm going to say. So there's mutilation and torture. There's a little bit of animal cruelty, a small part. Uh, a death, you know, death of many innocent people. But like the nefarious natures of the characters, the novel balanced the gruesome aspects of the story quite well. It's obvious the intention behind the novel is that it's an over-the-top kind of romp. It's not quite the book equivalent of extreme cinema, but it's violent and bloody and unapologetically so. It's not a serious fantasy, I would argue. Were it so, it would be probably horrifying. But because the hyperbolic violence is self-aware, or at least intentionally over-the-top, it's lessened by that very fact. It's almost silly at times, because there's also a lot of humor in the novel. Like, I laughed a lot. That being said, if I talk any more, I'm going to get into spoilers, but the book is an absolute riot. I adored it. I wanted more. I want to buy it in, 
you know, physical copy. <laughs> if Angry Robot, if you end up watching this, uh, if you have an art copy just lying around you don't need anymore, I would totally uh, take that off your hands. I'm giving this book a five out of five stars. I recommend it to people who like their fantasy bloody, irreverent, and have a dark sense of humor. Again, you, you, you can't be faint of heart to enjoy this, I don't think. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I'm actually going to talk about a few spoilers now because there's some things I kind of want to talk about, mainly the characters, but thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed that and I hope you pick up the Maleficent 7. So it's funny, I just finished filming this, so I have to add a little addendum here <laughs> before you get to my spoiler section. And uh, I just got an email from Angry Robot saying that they're going to be celebrating the launch of the Maleficent 7 on Thursday, uh, the 19th of August, with a free online event as the author chats with the Tide Child Trilogy's R.J. Barker, which is hosted by Agent Extraordinaire Ed Wilson. So they say, join us for a fun evening when, no doubt, Cameron will showcase his battle his battle weapons display or some of his epic Lego builds. Well, that sounds fun. So I'm going to actually add the link here. It's in my description. So if that's something that interests you, you can totally check that out. And yeah, so that was a very funny coincidence. Uh, and yeah, so now we're onwards on to my spoilers of the book. So thanks. So spoilers. I'm going to talk about Lorimer for a second. <laughs> I feel kind of bad saying that he's my favorite character because some of the stuff he does is just gross and abhorrent, but Johnson did a fantastic job creating a monster that is compulsively likable. The care he took towards showing how Lorimer's monstrous nature is a compulsion and not an enjoyment was intricately crafted. I really appreciated that balance. I loved how Lorimer seeks out human comfort at one point consensually and, you know, how he has Estevan, kind of his best friend, but presumably also an item at times as well, how he keeps him alive because he needs that kind of humanity. Uh, I love how his, his motivations in helping the town is to basically get Maven to help him save his own people. He was complex and I, I really, I think that's why I liked him so much. He was such a complex character and the nature of his vampirism was really fascinating and he basically stole the page from me whenever he was on it. So yes, yes, another book crush. I can't help it. <laughs> oh, and the part when he gets seasick and vomits blood everywhere made me laugh so hard. A seasick vampire is, it's a hilarious concept. <laughs> that was so funny. Oh yeah, and at the end when he expels himself from Jarek, that was fantastic. I knew, I'm like, there's no way he's completely dead. I'm like, there's no way. He's, he's going to come back, but I did not expect him to come back like that. Though, the novel set it up really well. I, I, I thought he did a great job. Another character I really liked was Red Penny. I adored her relationship with Amog and that kind of mentor kind of relationship that they had. And the part where she sees Lorimer naked made me laugh so hard. I must have read it like three times. Like she was a great bit of comic relief. And I loved how she got Amog's axe at the end or her Warhammer or whatever it was. I can't remember. Um, I thought that was awesome. <laughs> Amog herself was great. I loved the little details about the orc culture, like how they chose their sex and gender and how they call their kids grubs. <laughs> it was so funny. And she's such a badass. Like, I love that she got that kind of, that death that she wanted, that like, you know, death in battle. That was really cool. I like how, uh, I also like, so I thought the twist with Grace at the end didn't come as much of a surprise. I don't think we're supposed to expect it to be as a surprise. I mean, it's kind of obvious that what's going on. But the Black Heron kind of twist plot made up for it entirely. I wondered what her end goal was the whole time. Like, there's no way just saving the town could possibly be it. So her becoming the Demon Lord was fantastic and it fit her personality perfectly. I really loved that. As much as I would have loved a longer epilogue to kind of see where everyone was, I also wasn't enjoyed kind of being forced to imagine their possible next steps, like their surviving characters anyway. Basically, I just loved this book. I thought it was so much fun. If you've read the book, let me know if you liked it as much as I did. If you didn't, that's cool. If you do, uh, rock on. Uh, yeah, so thanks for watching. <laughs>